Welcome, everyone. Welcome to, welcome to the first virtual event for the Krieger Museum. We are so delighted that we've been working very hard to move all of our spring programming uh, into a virtual format, um, really to be extended into the fall. And I'm so delighted to be launching it into this new era and to have with me Melvin Nesbitt Jr. Hi, Melvin. Hey, yo. <laughs> So I so desperately wish we could all be in the galleries at the Krieger. There's nothing I would want more. Um, I'm very happy that Melvin is joining us from his studio. And so we can kind of get a little sense that we're near artwork. But, um, but just, you know, believe us that we're, we're so excited to have you here. And we can't wait to share what's coming. We're, we're working to put everything online um, for the next really for the next six months and then until who knows, but, but we want you to be enjoying the programming that we've been planning and, and Melvin and I have been, Melvin, we've been talking since January about this event. So it feels pretty wonderful that we can finally be having this conversation. So thank you so much for being here. And before we get started, as with all of these new virtual programs, we have a bit of housekeeping. So bear with me for a moment. You might be wondering why you don't see the other um, the other guests in this format. So this event is in a webinar format, which means that you'll only see me and Melvin. Um, we we can sense that you're there. We we wish we could all be together, but um, but you will only see us. There is the opportunity to ask questions through the Q and A format. So if you go up to your toolbar, toolbar you'll see a little. Q&A button and at any point you can leave a question there and at the end of the program we will look and and find your question and hopefully and answer as many as we can. Um, so <coughs> Melvin and I will be talking for a bit and then again we'll open it up to questions. This program is being recorded because we are hoping to make it, we are making it available on YouTube as soon as we can and so we want it to be accessible to anyone who wasn't able to join us today. So Okay, I think that's all my housekeeping that I'm responsible for. So anyway, thank you all for being here. And I hope that you're all well and safe and comfortable wherever you are right now. So, Melvin. Yes. I know that everyone has seen Melvin's bio, but I, I want to do a little bit of an introduction just as a refresh. But um, Melvin is now based in Washington, D.C. As an art, artist working primarily in collage, but is originally from South Carolina. And I'm so happy that DC has welcomed you with open arms, and maybe we can keep you for a while. <laughs> um, so, Melvin is currently a resident artist at Stable Artist Studios, where we're finding him right now. Um, and we can actually see behind us, I'll ask him this later, we can see behind him a project that he's been working on. So, it's exciting that we get to see a bit behind the scenes. Um, and Melvin has had exhibitions in DC, in uh, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina, but most recently at the Sense Gallery in Washington. Um, and then he has some projects coming up as well. So I'm so happy to have you here. Okay, so what? So you know, this is. Let's just say I just want to share with everyone. This is now the third or fourth conversation we've had about your work, and so. You know, I for anyone who was at our first stable artist talk, um, you you probably know that this these are ra rather casual artist talks that we've been um, organizing. But I'll try not to just launch into the fourth part of this conversation, but to share a bit about what we've been talking about over over these months as well. So I know I have a big question for you, and I know you know what my question is, but. Um, I'm, I'm going to be showing Melvin's work for the first chunk of the program, and then we'll be talking about a piece um, by Ma Max Beckman in um, our collection that he chose to, to respond to. But first, Melvin, I'd love to ask you why you work in collage. What is it about collage that has gotten its hold on you? Uh, well, when I first started collage, I intended to use it as um, sketches or preliminary drawings or paintings before my actual paintings. And um, I'd taken a workshop through Washington Studio School with artist Ken Culey, who um, pretty much introduced me to the process or to the way that he does collage. And um, in making those little uh, 
drawings and, and paintings, I really enjoyed the process. I enjoyed the end result. I um, felt freer to experiment than I did with all paints. You know, um, as a student, as a, uh, a novice artist, um, supplies are really expensive. Mm. So when I started doing um, collage, I was basically just using acid-free printer paper and newspaper. So um, that was the bulk of my supplies right there, you know, pretty readily available. And um, it just freed me up to experiment and to try all these different things that I wanted to try that I had been reluctant to try with the more expensive materials that I had been using in painting. So um, and then I had my first collage piece in a show at uh, DC Art Center. Mm -hmm. And um, it sold on opening night. So that was kind of, that kind of cinched it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so interesting too, because you've, you've worked, you've, you started bringing other things into your collage since then, right? That it might've mm -hmm. started as primarily paper, but can you talk a little bit about uh, especially since we can't see the works in person and images only go so far. Can you tell us some of the other objects or elements that you use as well? Um, I have started doing a little more with um, acrylic transfer, transferring photographs. I actually use actual photographs also in my, in mm -hmm. some of my pieces. Um, and uh, I have been finding um, materials in like hardware store, like pieces of screen, mm -hmm. or um, my mom, um, she's a printmaker. She sends me a lot of uh, patterns and textures and stuff that she creates in her studio. But she's also um, an, a horticulturist. She's very much into plants and flowers and things. So she sent me like uh, dry plant materials and mm -hmm. different things like that. I had a piece of cactus that was dried that I used in one of my pieces in one of the girl's hair that just created this this um, really uh, uh, sophisticated texture that I wasn't able to achieve, you know, from uh, messing around with my other materials. Um, but I'm always looking for new stuff to work with. I uh, am, up until now, I've kind of manipulated the paper and materials to sort of suit what uh, imagery I was trying to create, but, um, now my process is getting to where I'm very much interested in letting the materials stand um, for what they are and trying to, uh, instead of manipulating them to work for me, I'm trying to work with them. Mm -hmm. So um, that's still in a very experimental phase. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we'll see how it goes. It, do you, do you find that... To bring in. Sorry, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. always looking for new materials to bring in particularly more textured or thicker papers and things that I can work from, work with. The, yeah. reason, the reason why I wanted to start talking about the surfaces and, and the objects, you know, the, the material that's in your work uh -huh. is that, of course, everyone's been looking at these two works by you for all this time we've been talking and, and are probably ready for us to start talking about them. But I wanted mm -hmm. to try to bring, bring their, um, you know, the, the physical presence of these works into our heads as we're talking about them. Because I think one thing I was so struck with being in your studio was, was the texture and was the kind of incredible variety of surfaces and how, you know, we think of collage as being, um, you know, as, as being kind of, in some cases quite traditional, but really like you're working in all of these different ways that are very experimental that, that I think is so interesting. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the general scales that you work in? That's the other thing that I always like to remind people how big the actual things that they're looking at are? Well, um, <laughs> before Stable, before I moved into Stable, the largest I had worked was probably 24 by 30. Um, immediately when we moved in last June, because I had a, a solo show coming up in, in the following December, I um, got larger uh, surfaces to work from. Uh, the fastest you can is uh, six feet by five feet, I believe. And Drummer Boy was 40 by 40 inches. Okay. Um, I am not stuck on a particular scale 
Um, I really, really like working on a larger scale more because it's so much more physical. And um, when I'm working smaller, you know, I'm just kind of hunched over a table or something like that. But currently I have, I have two projects running and one is really, really small. And one is six feet by 14 feet. So um, yeah, I kind of <laughs> go back and forth. Well, at least I have been for the past year. And it looks like that's gonna be, you know, my routine for the near future also. Mm. Yeah. So I'm I'm kind of I've mess I'm messing with our heads by putting these two works together in the same size because really fast as you can is huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, is. But I think these are good reminders. I mean that that it there is such a difference in working in those two scales. Mm. But it was it was so much fun um, to do um, because it was this was my first really really large piece mm -hmm. and um, like I said I was so used to working really small that working with larger pieces of paper and larger patterns and everything um, it was a lot of fun I even was able to get some fabric in this one I have um, on the left. There's a little girl with a red um, checkered shirt and she's wearing um, denim. I use pieces of denim for her jeans and also for the kid in acid wash. Okay. So that was the first time that I was able to um, successfully incorporate fabric into one of my collages. Um, and I may not have tried it if I hadn't been working on such a large surface. Mm -hmm. um, also, this was one of the first pieces where I didn't collage over the entire surface. <laughs> it was just too big. <laughs> and so I, you know, experimented with leaving spaces, uh, painted areas open, and I did a lot with charcoal in this one also. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it really is kind of a marriage of your, your training as a painter and the collage work then, this piece. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Well, so now let's talk about the works themselves because I think we could we could go down a road with the, the details of materials for this entire talk. <laughs> um, but I'd love to talk about what's going on in these works. And, and as we've been having these conversations over the last, gosh, six months now, um, I think it's so interesting the way that you approach representing joy in your work and, and showing showing black children in these mm -hmm. moments of joy in, in a, actually a pretty particular place. So do you want to tell us a bit about where that yeah, is? Yeah, well, um, all of this imagery is based on my memories of a housing project where I lived as a kid. I lived there from kindergarten through the end of sixth grade. Um, this was in Spartanburg, South Carolina, <clears throat> which is in the upstate. Uh, I I actually began working on these images. Well, it wasn't going to be about joy when I started it. Mm -hmm. When I started this memory work, I had the intention of um, exploring some thoughts and feelings that I had related to a trauma that I experienced as a child. Um, and I was molested when I was in the third grade by a family member. and. Um, I, it has, you know, impacted me my, my entire life. Um, I've, you know, struggled with depression and anxiety and, and other issues as a result. Um, so a few years ago, after I got my first studio in Silver Spring, I decided I was gonna, you know, dive into this. I've been putting it off long enough. Let me exercise these demons and, and work out these feelings and emotions. And um, once I got into it, I started to realize that this was not something that I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt like I, I wanted to create imagery that, um, that I really, really wanted to see. So I started making uh, I actually decided to uh, go back to an earlier age, you know, from the time when the trauma happened and make imagery, you know, based on that period in my life. And um, so that was how we got to the joy 
as a major theme in my work. I, it was something that I wanted to see more of mm -hmm. was um, Black people experiencing joy. Mm -hmm. So uh, once I started working on this type of imagery, um, it really changed everything about my process and the way I work. Um, I wake up early, early in the morning, just couldn't wait to get to the studio mm -hmm. to get work on it. And I, you know, would be there most of the day. And um, I, I typically work five or six days a week. Um, and it's just been so motivating and uh, exciting for me. And I am having so many more memories come to me the more I work on this. Um, but I think probably the most important thing that this work has done for me is that I've made peace with a lot of things, um, a lot of issues that I had related to my past while working on this. For one thing, I had to um, consider who uh, my family, my parents and my family were at the time, what type of life they had before they started having kids, my parents, and then what that must have been like for them. My mom, I was born like a couple of weeks after my mom graduated high school. So she was very, very young. Um, and it was, uh, it, I honestly held a lot of things against my parents about the way that I grew up. Um, but once I started working on this project, having to put myself in their shoes and think about mm -hmm. their situation before I was born, and then the events, and even the political uh, atmosphere at the time. Um, it has given me much more compassion and empathy for who they were then. And it's really helped me heal quite a bit. This project has been the best therapy ever. <laughs> yeah, wow. I mean, and I think, and this is something I know we had at some point talked about that, I mean, you put so much of yourself into these pieces. And, and mm -hmm. I am curious, you know, in, in what cases there are specific memories in what cases there are more general memories but I imagine that putting it out there in an exhibition and having people respond to it when it's so personal is maybe challenging or or wonderful or but it's it's all wrapped up in 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 how personal the work is um it's been it's actually been great uh to uh talk about it and share it and have other people relate to it and, and connect with it um and it's been great because I remember being a kid and thinking about the trauma that I experienced and realizing that so many other kids in my community uh, had experienced great trauma at an early age. I remember thinking and feeling that people didn't really care that much about what happened to us, mm. to you know the black kids in the project. So having people show interest in my work is really exciting to me. Mm -hmm. because that means I now have their attention and they're now thinking about these kids, mm -hmm. you know, and um, hopefully developing a, a great deal more empathy, you know, for, for black children in America. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, and I think in terms of, oops, I knew that was, <laughs> that was what I was dreading. Um, and I, what I love too is that, um, you know, you seem to be, obviously drawing from really personal memories, but then in this work in particular, I want to talk about the mm -hmm. photographs that you have embedded because it also seems like, as you're saying, you're really thinking also about a broader cultural um, response or, or having a dialogue in, in a way with your viewers that engages all of these different elements, personal, but also broader. Um, so mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about this piece and also the what's going on in the brickwork, which I love? Um. This piece specifically was about a babysitter that we had. Um, we had a, one of my cousins, Teresa. She used to babysit us a lot. My mom, my mom worked and went to school. So we would see her like early in the morning before going to school. Um, and then, you know, on the weekends. <laughs> but uh, my cousin Teresa, while babysitting, she would also uh, take jobs doing girls' hair in the neighborhood. And um, I, I don't know, that memory just really stuck with me. Um, the women and, and girls and their hair was always uh, 
a big thing, you know, we were all aware of and, and all that. But uh, with this particular piece, I was thinking more along the lines of like the, the ingenuity and, and resourcefulness of the people in these uh, type of communities mm -hmm. and um, how they, you know, kind of find ways to support themselves in non-traditional ways or they using natural talent and skills and things like that. Mm. Um, so many of the residents and, and housing projects get such a bad rap, you know, and, but little things like this are important. I mean, it's important to a community to have someone, for the women to have someone that they can go to, you know, to make, to fix their hair for them, you know, and it's, it's it was just, um, it was a fond memory that I, I wanted to share. But as far as the photographs, particularly in the brickwork, those are all celebrities um, from the time period, from the early 80s. You have Janet Jackson and uh, Whitney Houston, um, Grace Jones and uh, Diana Ross. And um, they were all known, you know, pretty popular for their hairstyles. It was a big part of their celebrity persona. So, um, yeah, I uh, wanted to add that as to sort of, like you said, sort of encompass more, uh, to make it a little bit broader, but also I was wanting a little more activity and texture in the brickwork also. So, you know, it was a little cosmetic decision as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, I mean, this this gets to, this is something that you had said in, in the artist statement that, that, um, that we were just sharing on social media that, you know, the collage itself is this kind of layering of elements in the same way that memories are a layering of elements. And I, I think in this work in particular, you have, it, it feels so built up in a way in terms of just how much you're really, you know, adding to the surface and how much you're mm -hmm. creating um, this, this kind of world, right? I mean, that it is, it's, it's a physical environment because it's not just a flat surface. It's a built surface with all these elements that do emerge from the, from the board. So um, I, I, in this work, that feels very poignant. Thank you. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, often, I'm not sure what's going to be happening in the image when I begin it. Um, I, about 80% of the time, I will build the setting first, I'll create mm -hmm. a setting first, and then try to decide. <laughs> uh, or something will remind me, I have a memory or something will trigger and it'll decide what it wants to be. You know, it'll tell me. Um, but yeah, the um, settings are uh, really important to me, space in which things happen. And um, I'm always saying that I'm a visual storyteller because mm -hmm. that's how I think about my imagery when I'm making it. Um, and I, I do a lot of layering, particularly in the beginning, uh, because I'm not sure mm -hmm. um, what it wants to be yet. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you'll get shapes or shadows or little textures that are surprises um, after you've been layering, you know, for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And that will inform, like, the next steps to go. And um, people tend to really like it. They love – It's the funny thing about it is a lot of it you can't really notice until – you're up close to the piece until you're in person with it. Um, another thing about a uh, collage that excited me was that from across the room, it looks very different than mm -hmm. it does up close. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's so much fun. <sighs> I mean, from across the room, a collage can look like a painting, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then up close and you start to see the, lake, the edges of the different pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just really fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And also the layering, um, I feel it gives it a sense of history, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I, like, there was something there before, you know, something mm -hmm. underneath that you can barely see it peeking through. You know it's there, but, you know, there's something else that's been built over the top of it now. So, um, yeah, does that answer? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's wonderful. It helps us, you know, because we're just looking at these things virtually, I think it just helps to uh -huh. remind us. And so I'm going to move it with that in mind, I'm going to move to this piece, which I know you were working on when I was in your studio and I know it, it gave you a bit of a headache, but it's 
it's such a wonderful piece. And I think, you know, as you're, I mean, what I thought was so interesting was seeing it in, in a not finished state, you know, that you were it was kind of in that in-between moment where you were still fine tuning it and to really see how you're building layers. So I'd love to hear you talk about this work and the challenges, but also how it's, it is a bit different than your other pieces. Yeah, well, this was a, my first really big commission um, that came to me right after my solo show. So I started it back in December. And um, I had not met the client or even had a conversation with them. And so I, this was hard for me because I was trying to figure out what they liked about my work <laughs> and what they wanted from me. And I, I didn't have any of that information. So um, it, was, uh, it was really tough in the beginning, but it, it caught, I, I figured it out along the way. Um, I uh, brought in, I uh, actually left a lot of things um, uncovered on this. Um, it still kind of looks like it was in a, in a work in progress kind of state, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was pretty pleased with it afterwards. It was, it was extremely challenging though, because I was really wanting to make the client happy, but I had no idea, you know, why, you know, they picked me to do this. So, mm -hmm. um, but as far as I know, they were really happy with the result. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they were. I mean, and I think one thing that's that's also interesting as we are talking about this marriage of painting and collage for you is that this it, a lot of it is painted paper, right? And so, there, oh yes, there is a lot of. And I remember you were working on. I saw you know you were. It was really just the cutouts of pieces in the same in the different intonations, but in the same one. You know, it it was kind of amazing to me to see that how well you were distinguishing between shapes. In putting it together, it's like such a complex puzzle piece when you're when you're working with painted paper. So um, mm -hmm. that seemed like such. I mean, that's it seems like a very nice marriage of those two for you. Yeah. Um. I uh. I've, I think I've wanted to do more mixed media for mm -hmm. a while now. Um, I didn't want to get out of the habit of painting and drawing, you know, and, you know, creating full paintings and drawings, uh, but I am a little bit obsessed with collage right now. Uh, but I, I'm always looking for new ways to kind of bring together the different lessons, um, that I've learned over the years and some of the many mediums that I've worked with. I really like to try to figure out how to incorporate more watercolor paintings into mm. this. Mm. I did that for a while and I really enjoyed it. And I just can't find a connection between watercolor and what I'm doing, what I've been doing lately. Um, but yeah, I don't really like limiting myself to any particular medium or, or uh, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Life in itself is just such a mixed match of things, mm -hmm. you know, of coming together of these different elements and kind of trying to create harmony and everything. So um, I've, I'm always looking for better ways to, to uh, communicate um, visually. And so I like to try, you know, all the different, all the different mediums available to me. Mm -mm. Will you remind me what's, ha what's happening in the background of this piece in the blue is there there seems to be some kind of stencil work or something that's textured and I can't remember what it was oh that is my mom's <laughs> some of my mom's floral prints okay. I incorporated into this piece yeah um they're not stencils they're uh screen prints that my mom made and I, I really want to collaborate with her um she, she does beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what you're talking about, right? The, the yeah. Type of, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. How, I mean, it seems like that, that's had quite an impact on your own work, your mom's work in printmaking. Yeah. Um, well, I've actually been making art a lot longer than she has. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but she went back to college in her late 50s in Spartanburg to Converse College, and she started studying um, printmaking, art and, and printmaking. And um, she was able to marry her history of being a horticulturist and a florist to her uh, printmaking. And it's to a beautiful, to a beautiful result. I, I really enjoy her work. Um, and the reason why we haven't really collaborated yet is because we kind of, you know, <laughs> she's my mom and I'm her son, and sometimes we kind of bump heads. And, <laughs> and there's this whole thing about, you know, somebody's got to be in charge, but, you know, <laughs> eventually we'll get around to it. Yeah, sounds like a good aspiration to have. Yeah, it is, because I, I really admire her work, and I, I would just love to, I, I, I think it's supposed to happen you know, that we collaborate on the show. Uh-oh, did you freeze up? Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to go to one of the questions then. The first one is from Carolyn. It says, I love the joy that you are projecting. Thank you. It seems universal. Did your focusing on those earlier years help you put the traumatic years in the background of your childhood memories? Um, I never put the traumatic years in the background. Um, I, but it has helped me to compartmentalize it and to live with it better th and to cope with it better than I have been, most definitely. Um, before doing this work, just thinking about it, would trigger anxiety and depression. Um, sometimes they could last for a couple of days, um, but I feel I have now better coping skills. And since I started doing this work, it's just really, um, it's done wonders for the anxiety and depression. Let's see. I guess I should do another one. Um, Caitlin, hi, Melvin and Danielle. So good to see you both. And thank you for this wonderful dialogue. Melvin, there's something musical feeling about your work, perhaps a relationship between music and lyrics or content and form. Do you listen to music while you're working? If so, what? Yes, I definitely listen to music when I'm working. Um, and I listen to all types of music. It really depends on what mood I'm in or what mood I want to be in, or um, what I'm working on. Uh, I've been listening to, uh, when I was preparing for my show last year, I was listening to a lot of 80s R&B um, music that I listened to when I was a kid. And uh, lately though, uh, Andy and I, Andy is my studio mate, we've been listening to a lot of jazz, some reggae, um, and uh, classical music. Yeah, I play a lot of classical music too. But uh, music has been not just a big part of my life, but in my family. You know, the, the image of Drummer Boy, that's about my little brother, mm. who um, as a kid, he was actually mimicking my dad, who has played drums probably since he was a teenager, and um, still does. 
every Sunday at his church. <laughs> And uh, my brother kind of followed in his footsteps. And I actually, when we were kids growing up, my brother, he got on my nerves so bad because he would beat on everything. Um, he would, my dad gave him a pair of drumsticks and he would just turn anything around him into a drum and it would just drive mm -hmm. me crazy. You know, we shared a bedroom, so it was a lot of noise. But he grew up and he, he made a couple of albums my brother did and he now does a, a podcast mm -hmm. where he talked a lot about music hip-hop mostly and um so my dad's sisters are a choir and you know my grandmother was in the choir and I sang in the choir for a little while so music is a big part was a big part of growing up for me so um yeah and it also just puts me in such a great mood so yeah, I do listen to a lot of music in the studio. Sorry, Danielle, I was um, answering some of the questions in the oh. Q and. Boy, you're you I'm so, you're running the show. That thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my connection. I don't know what happened, but I'm on my my hotspot of my phone now, so I'm not going anywhere. I apologize to everyone, but thank you for <laughs> you know picking up where we left off. That's great. Um, okay, so I want to make sure we can talk about talk about Max Beckman. So. Okay. I don't want to go too quickly through the other works because um, we do have a lot here and I feel like we could spend the next hour mm -hmm. continuing. But if, if let me know if you want to stop, if there's something you wanted to share about. This piece seems like it could be its own talk. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. That's probably the most personal piece I've made in the last year. This piece, A Man in the House, um, which is a, a reference to the man in the house rule um, where uh, families or women receiving uh, welfare benefits mm. uh, could lose them if they had a man living, an able-bodied man living in the, under the same roof with them. Mm. And um, for me, and a lot of the other boys in the community, you know, we would talk about this a lot because this, this meant that, you know, our dads couldn't come visit. You know, this, mm -hmm. for a lot of us, we were hoping that our parents would get back together, you know, so that kind of put some restrictions on that. Mm -hmm. um, it also meant that most of the adult men that came to the community would come under the cloak of darkness, you know, to avoid uh, police, that monitored the neighborhood and things like that. Um, it also meant that a lot of boys who were still underage but looked like adults were often harassed by the police. Mm -hmm. So um, this piece had to deal with my feelings about the welfare system. Mm -hmm. And I often felt like my father was replaced by a welfare check. You know, um, as a child, you know, that was my thinking, you know what I mean? So it, this was, this was, it wasn't hard to make, it's, but it's hard to talk about. <laughs> it's hard to talk about, you know, I regret, like a lot of kids who grew up without their fathers, that my father did not grow up, was not in the house with us growing up. Yeah, so that's what that piece is about. Mm. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's what's then. This is where collage is such an amazing medium, right? Because not only are you able to to bring us something that's so personal, but I feel like also by bringing in elements like it looks like the the coupon is a found, um, you know, something from a newspaper or, or found element, and the Uncle Sam seems found. I mean that it's this way of bringing the outside world into your work as well, that they're, well, you know. No, I drew and painted the Uncle oh, Sam. Oh, you did? Well, yeah. the food, co it, co the food stamps are uh, uh, acrylic. Oh, wow. This is where I wish we could be in front of the work. I would. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how cool. I used uh, use fabric and actual buttons for the father's shirt. I was going to ask you that. It looks like, yeah, wow. That's incredible. The yeah. older kid is charcoal. Okay. Yeah, and the, uh, the youngest kid is collage. And the reason I did that was um, the youngest kid is, the, is basically the, 
the um, protagonist of the story. I felt like he was the one most affected by the absence of the father mm -hmm. in the house. Um, because I was, um, I was, you know, I was a big brother, you know, in a way kind of parenting my younger siblings. Um, mm -hmm. So I was just kind of, um, you know, taking on all these adult responsibilities and everything. And I always felt, I felt bad that my dad wasn't around, but I felt worse for my little brother, mm -hmm. especially because my brother was like so much trying to take after my dad so much, you know, he so admired that my dad was a drummer and he wanted to be like my dad. And it was, um, yeah. So <laughs> can we move on? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, well, so, so, while, so I'm going to just flip through the rest that we have so we can get okay. to the back okay. on, but, but will you tell us while I'm showing everyone these images mm -hmm. about the project that you're working on? Because I think it gets to this idea of, you know, telling a story of, of a childhood that you hadn't seen before and how that's true for in a lot of these works. Mm -hmm. So how does that get into the project you're currently engaged in? Okay. Yeah. Well, my, one of my major, when I'm making this work, I'm, thinking about an audience of black children mm -hmm. from the housing projects. Cause I really, really just wanted them to see themselves in my imagery, you know, to see themselves being celebrated and joyful and hopeful and all that. And um, I had been struggling with how I was gonna, you know, get it in front of them. So uh, I currently am working on a children's book with a writer, uh, in New York City. He's actually from DC. I think he and his wife may have graduated from Howard mm. uh, University and they now live in, in New York City. And so he wrote to me right at the beginning of self-quarantine uh, with the script he had written for a children's book. It's about a little boy and his obsession with his father's beard mm. <laughs> and that in New York City. So this is, you know, this is the work that I'm, I'm working on, preparing to collage all the pages together. And um, yeah. So there's that. And then I recently got news of a, a public art piece at C.W. Harris Elementary School. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be doing that, working on both of those this summer. And so that's the large very piece. excited about because yeah. it's going to both, both works will be in front of the, you know, the audience that I've been hoping I could get for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I see how the it's the micro working and then the large scale working are very different. Oh yeah, yeah. See, like I'm working. These are ten by fifteen inches <laughs> each pages, <laughs> and then I'm gonna be working on a six by fourteen foot. So <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. Well, I'm so glad to hear the public commissions in DC are still moving forward too. That's encouraging. It's an important moment for that. Um, okay, so we were walking through the museum together now that I guess I was in January when we first met and you were, you were waiting to be, to fall in love with something to, to talk about from our collection. And this was when we thought we would be in the galleries and we wouldn't be able to show your work, which of course mm -hmm. being in this format is the best part is that we can show so much of your work. Um, so when you saw the, the Max Beckman here, you stopped dead in your tracks and we're just so excited. And I love that moment so much. And I'd, mm. I'd love for you to tell us why you picked it and, and what you've been, how you've been thinking about it. Um, immediately when I saw it, I loved it. Um, probably because the children, <laughs> and it reminded me of work I, I was doing at the time. Um, but I, I love the colors in it and I just love the composition of it. And it, it just struck me as something um, playful and uh, lighthearted immediately. That was how I felt about it. But after standing in front of it for a few minutes, you begin to notice some, some uh, darker elements happening in there, which I found even more intriguing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's a great, I think it's a wonderful piece. Uh, it really jumped out at me. Um, and there's a lot 
there's a lot to unpack there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's see, and I know from our discussions that you've you've been thinking about it. Your feelings about it have changed over time. That that you were, you saw so much joy in this picture when we first saw it, and I think mm -hmm. harnessing joy in the midst of trauma is such an important aspect of your work. That mm -hmm. in a way, it, it makes sense why this you know this kind of harnessing of joy would would be so interesting for you. I mean, this is a piece that. Um, Beckman t has a wonderful posi teaching position in, in Frankfurt and is forced out with the year before mm -hmm. the painting was made um, by the, the Nazi party and um, within a few years is deemed a degenerate artist. And, and so, you know, when we, when we think about his biography and where he is at this moment of painting this work, of course, there's all these very dark looming elements that are worldwide, but also very personal and very local for him. Um, I did read, and I'm pretty sure this is true, that he was um, staying with his in-laws on, on holiday when he painted this piece. And so, and in, in, the, in the Bavarian Alps. And so it made me wonder if he actually did see the scene of children frolicking in a, a mountain town and that, you know, in a sense, he is capturing something he's seeing. But yet, as you said, there, there are these looming elements that are hard not to to think of right. as being very dark. So, um, how are how is how have your how has your response to it changed over time as you've been thinking about it? Well, um, I didn't know anything about Max Beckman before when I saw this piece the first time, and since reading about his life and experiences and what was happening uh, before you know 1934 when he made this painting, um, it began to jump out to me these, you know, these heavy darks in the reading me. You know, this, there's something there. And then also the part, the very specific part of this piece that really disturbs me is um, the two girls on the left, mm -hmm. right in front of the girl in red. I don't know what that is. And I think it might be another child, but um, it's shrouded in all black, or mm -hmm. is it transparent in parts of the show? I don't know what's going on there. And I'm very intrigued by that. Um, and it kind of, this can't be a joyful scene with, with that piece there. There's something there that's just, I don't know. <laughs> but I, um, I love the compositional elements and, and how he's, he's used, uh, the um, the cross in the center, the uh, conflicting um, diagonals, and you know that they they represent this this uh, resistance or these mm -hmm. opposing forces, you know, kind of coming together, and it's just really difficult to. Um, to make that make sense in the context of children playing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and also the girl on the right in the skirt, the kind of sharp dramatic shapes of her arm and this, this black shape here, this how pointed it is, it almost looks like she's startled or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I really wish we could see her face. <laughs> but there's just so many things, so many mysterious things happening here that um, I started to see um, darkness in it. I still feel like it's probably about, well, it is about playing children, playing is the title. Um, but I'm trying to find this quote that I read by Beckman about combining dark elements with, with I have it if you want do you want me to pull it up so melvin yeah. had, melvin had me reading max beckman's writing as everyone he i had homework for melvin so we've been, <laughs> we've been, been reading about him together um but yeah do you want me to quickly read it and Please. i think yes okay. um so this is from a talk that max beckman gave um in i think it was 1938 it was in 1938, it was a talk in London, and it was very famous because it was 
at a moment that there was an exhibition in London that was in response to the degenerate mm -hmm. art uh, um, exhibition in, in Germany. And he was kind of, he was hoisted up to give this public talk. And, um, and I think it's a little complicated because he makes himself seem less political than he was on purpose because of the nature of the exhibition. But he does have this interesting uh, um, discussion of black and white and and I think in our purposes, this, this, um, the balance of joy and trauma is very mm -hmm. represented in black and white. So I'll, I'll be quick, everyone, I promise. Um, it is my fortune or misfortune that I can see neither in black nor all, neither all in black nor all in white. One vision alone would be much simpler and clearer, but then it would not exist. It is the dream of many to see only the white and truly beautiful or the black ugly and destructive, but I cannot help realizing both. And then mm -hmm. he, goes on. he goes on from there. But I, and I think it speaks so well actually to both of your work in very different ways. Mm -hmm. which I love that, you know, you're talking about, I mean, your own personal trauma, systemic racism in our country, you know, the lack of positive imagery of black children, but you want to show joy in your work too. Mm -hmm. You know that you you're layering all these things that are so important for us to talk about. But you're also bringing us an, an imagery that's really necessary in the world. You know that really does bring positivity with the acknowledgement of darkness, right? And I think we can only wonder what Beckman is doing in this work, of course. But I do think there is something similar in the way he's making sense of also showing darkness, but needing there to be joy. Do you think that's yes. a fair connection? I do, I do. And um, that oh, quote is so relevant to, <laughs> to all the work that I've seen by him. Um, yeah. The way he uses color, I think it's quite joyful, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, uh, it, but of course his subject matter is overwhelmingly, you know, impacted by the trauma that he experienced. Mm -hmm. So uh, that yin yang there is is really appealing for me at least mm -hmm. to work. Yeah, I, I love I love the work that I've seen by him, and I'm going to continue to study back. Mm -hmm. So thanks for this right. opportunity. <laughs> this is my classic art history comparison slide, and we get to see both of your work together. And I think it's you know it's interesting. I mean the the, the themes and the content that we've already talked about you can see, but also the mm -hmm. colors, I mean that, you know, there's a lot of parallels in the colors that you're, that you're both using. So um, that, you know, there's, I think there's very interestingly a lot of links there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we could keep going and going, but I want to make sure we leave time. Yeah. Q&A. So I'm going to quickly pop in and I'm going to try to get to everyone. Okay. So this question from Lynn for Melvin. Can you tell us a bit about the work that has pinned the wall behind you? That's a, that's a that's an easy one. I'll give you that one. Oh yeah, that's oh, that's, um, stuff from the children's book I'm working on. I uh, I wonder if I can bring you a little closer. So um, my finished collages are usually um, like the fourth or fifth collage that I made <laughs> of that piece. So I have a few collages here that I've started for this children's mm -hmm. book, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna do them all over again. But yeah, I just have each page kind of laid out on the wall so that I can get all the black, the background colors um, kind of cohesive and harmonized and then go back and collage over the scenes over the top of that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, this, this is the first time I've worked on a, on a book, so. <laughs> This um this new is challenging. If you have any tips, anyone out there listening, um, drop me my email. <laughs> I'm very excited for this. Um, okay, you actually have two questions about the commission, the entitled commission piece, and I'll flip back. Okay. To that. Um, two questions about why there the faces are not defined. Um. Well. Like I said, I didn't know what this client specifically wanted from me. Um, and a lot of the work that I had done before I did this commission, I had left the faces blank. 
And the reason that I do that is um, it's about empathy. You know, uh, it's about empathy. Uh -uh. Um, I have a series of portraits where the faces were blank. And I tried to put as much detail in the hair and the clothing as possible and to shape the face and the hairstyles and all to kind of give it as much personality as possible. Mm -hmm. But the goal was to have people see them and sort of implant their own uh, facial features in there or mm -hmm. someone else's, mm -hmm. you know, implant their own identity into it. And um, it was, you know, an experimental thing I wanted to try. So that's why this particular piece does not have faces. Um, mm -hmm. I was tempted several times to write and ask, but you know, they gave me instructions and came through someone else and it was, I don't know, I wasn't sure it was appropriate. Um, I have to tell you that um, since I was pretty much um, amateur before, um, I say about a year and a half, two years ago, and so I'm still learning a lot of stuff <laughs> about being a professional artist. Um, I made a lot of mistakes over the last year. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, um, I wasn't sure what was appropriate to, um, to do as far as reaching out to the client because this came to me as a commission through, mm. a, uh, um, through someone else. Mm. So that person was you know, acting as a go-between and was sending, giving me information from them. And I really just, I really wanted to reach out to the client and talk to them, but I wasn't sure that that was appropriate at the time. And so I just, you know, did the job and mm. to the best I could. But it would have been great to, to do that. I, that's probably a big mistake that I didn't um, push that. But, well, you know, you well, live and you learn. I, I should tell, I should have said before I asked you the question that both comments that asked the question had wonderful things to say about beautiful shapes and colors and textures and that the children's personality is shown through and that they, Great. they, love, they love that piece. So I realize I gave you just the, the second half, but, but I think <laughs> it is really successful. And I think it's, it's more just, it's interesting why you made that decision. Um, I also think in terms of speeding up your professionalism as a artist what being in your studio five to six times a, a week i think will do it <laughs> i think that's i mean talk about it the fast track to to kind of learn all of your your mistakes um efficiently i would say that's serious commitment so i have a lot to learn so i work a lot yeah. no that's that's yeah <laughs> um okay so then two more questions um what are the dimensions of man in the house what a wonderful artwork that was a um, man in the house is also six feet by five feet. Mm -mm. Yeah. Still large. It's big. You you didn't see that? I didn't see it in your studio. No, I wish I had. Yeah. Um, and I think it, I mean I think when you when you realize that that's fabric, it makes sense the scale because it's mm -hmm. it's you know it's true to life. Um, yeah, I love the fabric on the sofa so much. <laughs> I can't tell you how many homes I've been in where uh, the sofa is covered with a, 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 a bed sheet or something like that. <laughs> it's great. And I think, I mean, this speaks so much to the different, not just working with paper and collage, but working with other elements as well. Um, so another question, do you, do you see any connection to McLean Thomas's work in your work in terms of working, someone else working with collage? What was the name, artist's name? Nicolene Thomas. Um, unfortunately, I'm not familiar okay. with the I'll, artist. I'll send or... you some stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. But, well, oh. I, I mean, I think a bigger question is what, which artists are you looking at? If, if you know, who are your influences? Uh, um, I love Wangeshi Mutu, mm. um, uh, Derek Forjor. And um, gosh, I love so many of them. But I look, I look at uh, Four Drawers' work a lot. Um, and Conrad Maccarelli mm. um, and Schwitters. Sh Schwitter. Oh. Yeah. Her so. Schwitters? Yes. Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's good. Um, 
Interesting. And, uh, but my favorite, my favorite artist uh, was a uh, painter, Ernie Barnes. Mm. Um, and I study his work a lot um, because I love the, I love his figures. I just love the way he creates figures and the exaggerations and, and um, how he's able to, uh, to show personality, mm. you know, and mood just in body language and things like that. I, I think it's very um, superb. I just love his work so much. I think of this as a great body language, just in terms of like thinking about, you know, a personal, someone's personal life where they're lounging on the couch as a family. And I, mm -hmm. I know there's something so wonderfully personal about it. Um, yeah, I'm also yeah. curious whose photo is that on the wall? I don't know. <laughs> a lot of people have asked me that, but I don't know her. That yeah. was um, my old studio mate had a box of photographs and he's like, oh, you want these for your collages? I'm like, yeah, sure. And that was a group photo. Mm. And I saw that lady and I thought, gosh, she looks like, you know, one of my aunts. Yeah. So I took her out and I made her, you know, included her in the collage. <laughs> and I was just wanting to see what it would look like to put an actual photograph into um, one of my collages. And um, after that, that's when I started doing uh, acrylic transfer. Okay, great. Okay, well, we are just over an hour now. So I'm going to say thank you to Melvin. Thank you so much for taking the time and to putting up with all of our technical everythings that we've been trying to figure out for this event. And thank you all for coming and for staying for the whole thing yeah. and for your questions. And keep an eye out for our upcoming events on Zoom, but also we've been working so hard with our reopening plans. And as soon as we have them finalized, we will share them. So keep an eye on our website. We'll send you our upcoming events and also the YouTube link for this talk um, through your email at some point soon. So anyway, thank you, Melvin, so much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Paul. Thanks, Daniel. I appreciate Thank it. You.